you know, you can learn all the vocabulary you want. It's about you and I being able to have an interesting conversation together. And this is, I mean, the ultimate example of that, because now we're expecting anybody to listen and be interested. <laughs> it's like, we have, I mean, let's, you know, I'll get off point, but uh, hopefully the conversation will, will remain uh, interesting. And it's the same thing in music, whether it's a duo or a 12 piece band, you're, you're really, you're creating a conversation. And if you don't have something to say that's relevant, it's really apparent. <laughs> Welcome to episode 106 of the Bay Shed Podcast. My name is Ryan Roberts. What's up, folks? What's up? Uh, what's going on? I just got I just got back from Phoenix. I was in Phoenix for the Super Bowl, right? I got an on, ongoing tradition. I drive out to Phoenix and hang out with my dad. Watch the game with my dad. Right, we both both got the jerseys on. You know, I, I'm not related to the Super Bowl. I'm a Denver Broncos fan, so uh, the only football jersey I own is the Steve Atwater jersey, who's the safety for the Broncos. Uh, he's actually the reason I'm a Denver Broncos fan. I used to love watching Steve Atwater play. My dad, Chicago Bears fan, he's wearing the Dick Buckus jersey, and uh, we're hanging out. We're hanging out in the jerseys, watching the game. It was, a, it was a good game. It was a really good game, actually. Uh, I wanted to have seen the... I wished I wished the Eagles would have won. That's 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 what I was hoping for. Uh, it didn't happen. Apparently, they never came out of the locker room the second half. I don't know what happened there. They were on fire the first half. On fire. Um, you know, there, there was that little fumble that the Chiefs scored on. Other than that, they were pretty much on fire. And uh, after the half, after the half, they never seems like they never really locked it in and the Chiefs ran away with it of course for all of you that watched it you know what I'm talking about wasn't a total runaway wasn't a total runaway but all the momentum was on Kansas City's side um yeah so I was out in Arizona doing that just got back uh when did I get back I got back Monday got back Monday like I don't know three or four in the morning and uh now it's now it's back to it now it's back to the grind back we're back in it uh what's what's the latest what's the latest uh new tune for the album will be posted uh, for my album uh it's going up today just got that mixed back uh the tune is called generations and uh so that'll be there you can go by the bayshed.com click on the the tab that says album and uh you can check out and you can listen to it there uh what else is going on the workshops at lemur Music that I talked about have been moved, had to adjust the date. Those are now happening April 1st at Lemur Music. Uh, from 10 to 12, there's a classical workshop. From 1 to 3, there's a jazz workshop. And then from 3.30 to 5.30, there's an electric bass workshop. All those things are happening. That is all through the Bass Shed Academy. You can go to thebassshedacademy.org for more information uh, about those workshops. Now those are that's an in-person situation. It's an in-person situation. So um, you know if you're not not really near Southern California, well then that doesn't help you much, does it? Does it? <laughs> uh, if 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 I can, the the thought crossed my mind. If I can, I'm gonna you know try to record the workshops and have those uh, eligible, uh, you know, to check out. For anybody that might be interested online, you know, I got to <clears throat> I got to get all the paperwork together. You know, I got to have everybody that attends it in person sign off on being like, yo, if I'm on camera, that's cool. Because, uh, you know, you know, every time I've been on camera, I've had to do it. So I feel like I just have to do it. They're probably cool, right? Maybe that's just the paper. Maybe that's the that's the like, yo, I need you to sign this to be on camera. And then the paper just says, like, are you cool? Is it all right? Yes, I am cool. Yes, it is all right. All right, great. Done. <laughs> um, what was it last week? Last week, I got an exciting, exciting opportunity. I was hit up by Ampeg to come out uh, and check out, check out their new line of stuff. Uh, yeah, folks at Ampeg hit me up to come beta test some of their new stuff. Now, I did sign an NDA on that. I cannot talk about... Uh, 
I won't be able to talk about, you know, what I played through or what I think of it. Um, I'm going to let those guys know what I think of it. And then, so after, after that, after I link up with the guys, you know, the, I know a couple guys at Ampeg. The dude who recommended me for it is uh, one of the, you know, engineers and kind of sound designers there. And so I hit him up uh, after that. I'm like, dude, you know, thanks for, thanks for giving the, the other people at Ampeg my number. Um, you know, let me take you out for a beer. Right. So we went out for a beer. Great hang. Great hang. His name is also Ryan, Ryan Phoebus. Um We went out for a beer, which is... that. Yeah, that hang turned out to be, like, pretty epic. <laughs> we ran into some other people out there. <laughs> oh, that hang got, that hang got intense. Um, but it was, it was good to talk to Ryan about working at Ampeg. And I'm like, dude, you're basically, like, the guy who's in charge of designing the Ampeg sound with like this iconic history and like people that are Ampeg guys, uh, folks, folks, folks that are Ampeg folks, um, you know, like that's a sound, that's a sound, but you know, that, that seems like a lot of responsibility to kind of uphold the, the tradition of that brand's sound, you know, and what they're known for. And then, but also, you know, incorporate new technology and stuff like this. And, uh, that was a really cool discussion, and uh, I'm looking forward to having Ryan actually on the podcast so we can kind of share that conversation with you. That was a great conversation. Um, what I did tell him, <laughs> what I did tell him was like, dude, this sounds like a really fun opportunity. I'm down to come. I'm down to come up there to Ampeg and you know and play through some stuff. Uh, I've got to let you know, man. I'm not an Ampeg guy. Like, not interested. Just really not interested. Typically, if, if if there's like three amps that I see, you know, that I could that I could choose from for what I'd be playing through on a gig, um, Ampeg was like, you know, not not really in the running for what I would want. Um, specifically, but definitely, let's put it this way: definitely, if it's an upright thing, like I do not at all want to touch Ampeg uh, if it's an upright gig. But so he knows he knows going into it, and Ryan's a bass player also. Ryan's a bass player, and Ryan's an upright player. And so he, he's like, he just started laughing. He's like, "Good." <laughs> like, all right, man. Like, we're you and I are cool. Like, everything's fine. Just letting you know. Like, I hope I hope Ampeg proves me wrong. Uh, and so I'm excited to see what that's all about, and check out their new line of stuff. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't even know what I'm playing through yet. I have no idea if this new gear will be at the Nam show or not. I don't even know if Ampeg will be at the Nam show. Um, they'll have some things because they're owned by Yamaha, but uh, yeah. So uh, Yamaha, even last year when Nam was pretty weak, Yamaha still had their big like I think it was the third floor. Uh, yeah, their whole little commune up there. It was. Yamaha is a big deal. There was there was a there was a small Ampeg presence within the Yamaha booth, but Yamaha has so many things going on that um, there wasn't a lot of time, a lot of space uh, designated for bass or specifically Ampeg amps. Uh, I don't know, I don't know, but it'll it'll be interesting to uh, check out what they are releasing at Nam this year. Um, I'm I'm interested I'm interested to see what Nam is like. That should be. That should be fascinating, to say the least. Uh, yeah. All right, speaking of Lemur and Lemur Music, stop by lemurmusic.com. Everything you need for the double bass. Uh, again, the, the workshops that the Bass Shed Academy will be doing out there is April 1st. There's information for the Academy at lemurmusic.com. Uh, we actually have to have the internet folks, the website folks, kind of switch around some links. To that, but step by lemurmusic.com. Everything you need for the double bass. All right, on the episode is bassist Ted Pecchio. Ted Pecchio is a Nashville bassist. I got a message. I got a message from my friends over at IVPR in in Nashville, and uh, shoot me, shoot me, shoot me an email. Like yo, everywhere, everywhere I go, 
It seems like uh, I'm listening and seeing Ted Pacquiao play. Like, he's just kind of all over the place in Nashville. You need to talk to this guy for the podcast. All right. All right, cool. Let's line it up. So we did. So we did. Uh, and I'm glad we did. It was a wonderful time talking to Ted. And Ted is Ted's just all heart. All heart. Uh, and even, even talking about... Some of his work with Cornell Bruce Hampton, uh, Ted Ted got a little emotional about it, which I understand. Uh, Cornell Bruce Hampton had a big impact on, um, from what I gather from talking to Ted, so many that Cornell Bruce Hampton was around and impacted and influenced. Like he really, he really was a presence. And so Ted will talk about his time playing with Cornell Bruce Hampton. He'll talk about his time. Uh, in Nashville as a session player, doing some other tours. It's really, really a wonderful talk, and there's so many kind of nuggets of just great musician wisdom that Ted talks about. Uh, those are come, uh, some some important things I remember while, while talking to him. Is man, there's just all these little just nuggets. Like, I'm writing them down so I don't forget them and stuff, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, Ted is, Ted is absolutely a veteran bass player with uh, so many great things to share with the bass community. And here's my talk with Nashville bassist Ted Pecchio. Hello? Hey, Ted, how you doing? Hey, doing well, thanks, man. How are you? I'm doing well, I'm doing well. Uh, cool, man. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks for doing this. Um, Thanks, dude. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. It. Uh, I, I'm, I'm hearing that uh, you're a very in-demand guy over in Nashville. Uh, I think everybody is. Uh, <laughs> I need to go to Nashville then. I don't think it's the exactly I blowing Los Angeles? the whistle. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's blowing the whistle to say that there's plenty of work here. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it's been... Uh, it's been a real rush because I came from Atlanta. I grew up in Athens, Georgia. I grew up playing there, but always in original bands. Uh, and I'm, I'm self-taught, so I wasn't ever a session guy. Or uh, I tried to go to school. It really didn't go well. Yeah, same. Uh, same. Yeah. Did you First go you went to school for music, or were you trying to get like a degree in something else? Well, all I was gonna do, all I was gonna do, was music. Sure. In life. And I was just sort of appeasing, uh, you know, my mother by saying, well, you know, at least, you know, go through the process, get an education, study music, sure. you know, whichever. Uh, and more than anything, you know, just have a degree in an education as a parent. She was. Concerned. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but long story short. Yeah. I went to the University of Georgia and um, first day, uh, the base <laughs> instructor was Milton Masiagri. Okay. In incredible world renowned upright bassist who would fly every year to play for the Pope solo. Oh, wow. uh, like really amazing musician. And I walked into his office and he asked me to play G major in the first position. And uh I'd never had a lesson. I'd only been in bands. Yeah. Uh, I, I could play and I could learn and I had ears. But that was the first question, and I put my middle finger where a G would be, on, yeah, I found the open G and then found the G on the E string. And as soon as I hit that first G, <laughs> he said, stop. <laughs> <laughs> he, under, he understood what was uh, what was happening. Yeah, I was about to try to play the A with my pinky. And yeah. he was like, yeah, he was like, okay. So I got assigned to a TA who was also brilliant, but was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to do this. I think I'm going to be a dentist. Okay. But he didn't even he didn't even care. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I couldn't read music. I didn't know the notes on the staff. I, I thought I would submit myself entirely into it and really study and apply myself and learn the language by just moving there, so to speak. Uh, but everybody in my 101 class knew all of the theory and they knew everything. So it was just hangman and paper airplanes in a class of 300 people. But, you know, it really was because this was 88. Okay. So the things were still totally just fast times. Yeah, yeah. Movements, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I, I didn't make it in music school, so it didn't work out. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. Um, the question, while we're on the topic of that, do you feel like, and this goes, this question can be looked at from two different perspectives. How do you feel like that's maybe, it's something you should have stuck with 
or what have you gained by not going through, I don't want to say gained, but what skills did you learn or well, I think it's by, not, by not finishing? Because you have more time to practice, you have more time to do gigs, you have more time to actually do the craft versus studying the craft by not being in school. But then by not being in school, you don't get the degree. You don't right. create this sense of kind of uh, peers that you come up with. You know, there's there's plus and minuses to both. I feel like what was what was that experience like? There for you? certainly are. And now that I'm older, uh, and I learned this a while ago, but um, when I was starting out, the last thing I wanted to do was go to school because all of the music that I listened to, soul music, funk music, the Beatles, um, it, I I couldn't imagine that those guys spent four years in university right. studying counterpoint melody and tenor yeah, yeah, yeah. part writing like that's not an academic music like rock and roll and funk and that's kind of like you know a, that's kind of like a street music you know like you learn that's it by right. being there and, and side note my father is a, a brilliant and amazing bass player who yeah. did records with mutt lang and bill simzik and lewis mernstein toured the world played carnegie hall on and on pedigree he doesn't know the names of the notes Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm starting here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't grow up with him, so I didn't have lessons or anything. I never took any lessons. Okay. What I was afraid of was being uh, somehow um, held to some sort of rules mm. or guideposts within music. Sure. When, once I really learned, well, you can't do that. This is actually an F sharp. It's not a G flat. You know, immediately, I was just like, okay, well, we're, we can't even have a conversation. <laughs> it's this no. Um, but I, uh, you know, later in life, I started playing with a guy named Colonel Bruce Hampton, who really who turned my life upside down and changed everything about uh, many things about my life. Um, okay. And certainly about the way I approached music. Um. And I, I really, I was in a band with some some guys who had been to school at the highest level and were really great jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. And I had always uh, I'd grown up loving jazz, but even if it were a blues, the moment I started playing on a bandstand or anything, everybody present knew that I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> you know, I wasn't playing anything from the Omni book, you know, from yeah, a yeah, right. so there were no bebop riffs, there were no, and you know, it was just holding on for dear life yeah. um, and and i had a lot of physical ability and i had a lot of music in me it was always in original bands but mm -hmm. when it came to applying it toward a structured situation i had i honestly until i was 30 i didn't hear the forms in a lot of the music i was listening to mm. uh, within the solo because it okay. was all a mystery to me i had yeah. never been on a bandstand where it's just like oh no you stick to this and then it creates the ultimate freedom because everybody else knows where you are. You can right. be Rashawn Wall and Kirk and be blind, and everybody's going to know where the fucking where the downbeat, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> where the form starts. So now I can push against it. I can trap it. I can create. I can build. I can elongate yeah. uh, melodies. And now there's this whole world of possibility that was counterintuitive to me when I was starting. Because I thought, well, if I learn these scales, I learn these modes, and I learn these songs and all 12 keys, and I do it like this, then I'm going to be just like everybody else that did this, uh, with, with many respects anyway. Sure. Uh, and I really didn't want that. I didn't even want to go to school for music, and I just made a conscious decision impulsively at 18, like, okay, well, then I'm just going to do it. I'll move to France to learn to speak French, and we're just going to make this happen. Yeah. And again, I, I was just pretty much ridiculed from the first day. And that part didn't bother me. It just, I, I just couldn't hang on. Mm -hmm. I couldn't complete an assignment. <laughs> I'm, still looking at a, I'm still looking at another sheet of paper where I've written out the names of the notes on the staff. You know? Yeah, yeah. So this I was, was that far. This was studying jazz at the college? No, no, no. It was um, just simply music. Theory. Oh, just music theory. Okay. Okay. No, nobody was even going to think about putting me into any sort <laughs> yeah, of Yeah, you don't even have to play change with that. Ensemble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't have a jury. Yeah, it was just... But, but what you're hanging around these kids, what you're hanging around these kids in uh, college, and they're listening to probably, you know, old bebop records or whatever, talking about... I didn't some... get along. Yeah, 
Right. But but what were you listening to that they probably weren't aware of? Oh, gosh. Like you were probably it, about maybe digging on the meters or something. And they're like, what? Who's the meters? All I know is John Coltrane. Like, well, what? even deep. Yeah, even deeper than that. I mean, Magic Sam, Guitar Swim. You yeah, know, nobody okay. had any kind of even interest. Yeah. Uh, and seeing what was going on there. And yeah. I realized that later in life. So just to say that, what, going back for a second, when I turned 30 and started playing with Colonel Bruce, uh, I wanted to play jazz and I wanted to be able to hang and I wanted to start a combo with these people. So I started to really readily apply myself to learning tunes, okay. which, you know, honestly, whether it was with my bandmates writing them or covering something is how it had always been done anyway. Yeah. It's just, it's just like, oh, these pieces fit together like this, which is like that, but this is different. You know, for me, it was all about number relationships. It wasn't about, you know, playing uh, a dominant seven chord or, or a, a minor seven flat five, a half step up. You know, right, like right, right. There, there was no application of that sort of thing. It was all very creative endeavor that was very math based for me. Okay. So it was all intervolic, which would play out wonderfully when I moved to Nashville. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. <laughs> so Yeah, I'll, that was the first question, and I'll eventually get back to that. Yeah. Just to say that, like moving here, uh, or, or at that time, I really did put the effort in. I still can't sight read, but I can read any chord charts. And I played a lot of jazz gigs and would have a uh, I had a house gig with Grant Green Jr. and Ike's Doublefield in, oh, wow. in Atlanta every Monday. Okay. Uh, does does Grant Green I, sound like his dad? Oh, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> he can do, well, he sounds like him, and then if he does his dad, it's his dad. Yeah. Like, you know, I um, mean, we both know people that, like, uh, their parents are kind of high-profile musicians, and sometimes they're on the same instrument. And when, when they play, like, they don't sound anything like you know, their father on the, on the same instrument, or sometimes they sound exactly like their father. On yeah, the same he doesn't instrument. sound like his father, but he can do it. And I had the okay. same experience where I had to play some of my dad's songs that mm. I, I never learned them. I didn't grow up, like, figuring out records or transcribing at all. Okay. So, like, all of the music that I took in, if it was James Brown and the Apollo, probably the most listened to album of my life. Yeah. I never once sat down and was like, oh, what's going on here? Yeah. I just had an emotional response to the music that when I picked the guitar back up, it just went bonk, you know, yeah. it came out. And, uh, I guess I was going after the feeling of it more than I was trying to figure out analytically, like how they were applying these horn parts to this bass line. Or, right. You know, that's never been how I did it. I think uh, it, I'm definitely still in my 50s a folk musician. Yeah. Uh, and I love playing jazz. I, I love jazz music and i think it's the highest art form uh for music honestly uh for western music um and uh i mean i yeah. I, I gotta say on the topic of jazz like i have a record coming out it would be classified as a jazz record the thing about jazz culture is it's up its own ass a little bit you know what i mean yeah. like the dudes typically are way too snooty they don't come from enough of knowing what's going on other than jazz they're just in this little bubble of jazz um too much and it's not kind of coming from any other influence which yeah. <laughs> you know if you go all the way back to charlie parker like he was listening to hindermuth like he was getting his his That's vocabulary right. and he was getting his information for what would create bebop from from other music so it's like dude, right. well this this became this toxic little bubble of jazz that's so annoying like you guys are like just regurgitating the same crap over and over again. Uh, I enjoy the intellectual intellectualism of it. Okay. I, I, I enjoy the music when it's expressive. Yeah. I really have an, an, an extreme reaction to music that sounds like it's for the sake of of doing the thing, performing. Yeah. Or or uh, using a an uh, 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 an element, you know, an academic element to you know, create something that maybe, I don't know, that, that could be interesting and, um, you know, done in the right way. But I, I don't know. It, it's more to me about capturing the essence and the feeling of music and the sure. way it impacts you when you hear it, whether it's lyrics or melody or rhythm. Um, right. I, th I think that the most important thing is that. It's, yeah. got, it's got to deliver something <laughs> in the end. And as far as the studiness in jazz, 
I mean, that certainly exists, and I'm still intimidated. My buddy hosts the bass player, hosts the jazz jam here at Rudy's in Nashville on okay. Sunday night. And, uh, you know, I just can't – I can do what I do, and I can hang in the changes and play. But the moment I start playing and I don't quote something – yeah, <laughs> right. right. And you don't again, know the intro from some specific record that everybody will just start playing it. And like, not even that. I'm talking about quoting a line from Sonny Rollins' solo. Okay. You know, more specifically, like when I go to play, or it's just like I get a break and they hand me the ball. Like immediately, I'm going to go. Pardon me for that, right. for that moment. You know, and try to see something that's happening, and it's probably going to be. I, I don't know what it's going to be, but it won't be something that's contrived. Right, right, right. You know, and I don't have that arsenal of, uh, you know, Charlie Parker, Omni Book, uh, yeah. phrases to pull from, unless I stole them from Jocko, just because there was something, you know, that I always loved. If he sure. did, you did, you know, yeah. or, or, you know, some little move. And then I would just, without even putting on the record, it would just be in my head and try to figure that out and start applying that to my own vocabulary. Sure. Sure. Uh, which is which is the key in every genre. It doesn't really matter how good you are. It's really knowing the vocabulary. I one hundred percent agree with that. One hundred percent agree with that, and think that a lot of jazz. While well, we're on the topic of jazz uh, musicians, jazz musicians really focus on vocabulary, whereas maybe instrumentalists in other genres don't as much. But you being in Nashville, country music has a vocabulary. Country bass playing has a vocabulary. Rock music has a vocabulary. Uh, when I was prepping for this interview, I found this little clip of you on TalkBase. Um, What's that? Let me let me see. It's you with Oliver Wood at the Millennium Stage. Okay. January. I don't know the year's cut off. I don't know what year. But this is this sounds like super New Orleans to me. Like this music just uh. sounds incredibly Louisiana. Me. Well, I love Alan Toussaint and, and everything he was involved with, from Lee Dorsey to, uh, you know, obviously the meters. And really, the, the whole, uh, the depth of that music is endless. It's not yeah. just what people think it is. Uh, there's so much music that's come out of New Orleans. Guitar Slim that I cited earlier yeah. in the 40s, recording with Ray Charles and Lowell Folson. Just the, oh, the depth of incredible music. I mean, it's the birthplace. That's the origin. That's sure. really the, the motherland. So I think um, Kofi Burbridge was the first one, the great keyboard player and flautist. He unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Uh, he was with Derek Truck for 20, 25 years. Uh, and O'Teal Burbridge's brother, older okay. brother. Uh, he told me one time, he was like, blues is the root, jazz is the fruit. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. 100%. And that always stuck with me because I could never understand why these guys that were so great, like on Sunday night, who would take these amazing bebop solos, would come down to my Monday jam and not sit in. And it's straight up blues. Mm. But it's because there's a vocabulary. Yeah. And, and if, you don't, if you don't know how to support it and have a conversation, you know, you can learn all the vocabulary you want. It's about you and I being able to have an interesting conversation together. And this is, I mean, the ultimate example of that, because now we're expecting anybody to listen and be interested. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I know. Like we have, I mean, let's, you know, I'll get off point, but uh, hopefully the conversation will, will remain uh, interesting. And it's the same thing in music, whether it's a duo or a 12-piece band. You're, you're really... You're creating a conversation, and if you don't have something to say that's relevant, it's really apparent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and again, just it might be a very simple vocabulary. It might be simple to write a haiku, mm -hmm. you know, versus a James Joyce uh, Ulysses or something. Sure, <laughs> you know? sure. But then, okay, well, write one. Right. You know, it, it's just now you have to use those tools to communicate maybe the same exact thing from Ulysses, something very powerful. How do you um sorry to interrupt you there? How do you yeah. how do you apply this dialogue concept in in a studio session? When you're going it's into the a same, session? Look, here's a quote from Colonel Bruce. Okay. It's it's, it's the same thing always. No matter <laughs> the situation. There's no difference. Yeah, yeah. Because we're we're doing something that's sacred. This mm -hmm. is music. This isn't like, I don't care if it's for Norelco. I've never done that sort of thing. 
when we're musicians and we're in the room together, we're not uh, pasting wallpaper. You know, the whole idea here is to connect and create something wonderful together. Uh, we have that opportunity. We're here together. We all have this immense talent combined. And if we just simply, and here's the quote, you get your butt out of your face. Yeah. You, you, you've got to get your butt out of your face. That's as plain and simple as it gets. You have to get out of your own way. You have to get out of the idea that you're in a particular situation and that it is going to require X, Y, and Z because you've already culminated. And this, this is now assuming you've put the time in the shed, okay, which is not the same. So whether you're making stuff up, which is what I did, <laughs> to earn facility yeah, yeah. and say, like, this is the same note that this note is and this note is, and then like, oh, this repeats, and oh, I can do this upside down. Yeah, You know, you do, you do put in the time, whatever that is, and you make sure that you can play your instrument. Now, that might be three months and you're ready to go. I, I did my first game at three months, and it was I felt totally in control. I didn't know what I was doing, but I memorized things, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> you know. But if you go into a session with any... Kind of uh, obviously, when you hear first hear the song in Nashville, it all happens very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't really done much of any, I would say, hard country music. And I played on some big country songs, I guess, but it was they seemed like rock and roll sessions with Tom Bukovac or you know. Uh, when you Nick say Uber. hard country music, do you mean difficult music, or do you mean like hard country in like the sense actual, of like yeah, actual, yeah, like homegrown old school country? Whether well, actually, I've played more of that since I've been in town. I haven't played any new country. Okay. I've been on a couple, on a few of those sessions, and it went really well. But uh, what I'm saying is, even in those cases, I'm not thinking of this as country music. I'm not thinking of it as R&B music. The producer is doing that because he's trying to plug it into a format. Sure. I'm trying to bring what I can to the music to really help support the song and whoever has the ball. You know, at any given moment, where there's the soloist or the singer or the background vocals, it's like if I'm the one creating the chord, yeah, yeah. the bottom note, and on the tie-in, with me, the bass is a rhythm game. See, that's what it is with my dad, too. It's all about the right hand. Yeah. So he knows where he can get around, and from there, it's just, he's Carl Radle. He yeah. can just, oh, go, oh, go, oh, go, oh, he's amazing. Uh, it's the same kind of thing. Without um, plugging it into a genre, like you're getting in the session... And you're just supporting whoever has the ball, which I like that analogy a lot. Um, but it, but it's, it's about the whole butt out of your face, if I could explain yeah, yeah. it really. Sure, absolutely. There's so many things you could bring into the situation, even outside of, oh, this is country music. Okay, now all of a sudden, oh, this is Dan Huff or somebody is a huge producer. Yeah. I don't want to do something stupid, so I'm going to play this thing. Yeah. Worst thing anybody could ever do in music is think that they have to eliminate anything we're having a conversation right now i'm not just gonna like pour paint on the phone yeah you know? <laughs> it's like it would be out of context sure I'm not, I'm not just gonna start going off in some rant about politics it's like we're, we're trying to focus and be together and have a conversation it's the same thing and if you're thinking about anything even thinking about like oh cool this is that change where the two five one like goes down a half step and then it's a very quick like like maybe a key change or something interesting. It's just like, oh, I was just even developing this cool thing. I could just walk up like this, and it's all it's gonna just seem right. I'm gonna I'm gonna play right through these changes. And you're not yeah, even yeah. Here. I would never in a moment in my life on my instrument ever think of something like that while I was performing or playing with somebody, because now you're thinking. So your immediate RAM that you're using to process the now is now half consumed with you trying to do some contrived bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me use the word. Okay, hear about this. Lick. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> oh, cool. This is the tempo I can pull off that lick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, what are you talking about licks? Yeah. You know, the point is. Your whole life up to that moment, you've accumulated this immense knowledge about what you're doing. You already know that cool fucking thing that you just figured out with the 251 modulation. Yeah. You don't have to think about it. If in that moment, that's where you're paving the road 
for this soloist or for that vocalist or for that rhythm section, or you're even just like what, whatever your role is in that moment, that shit comes out mm-hmm. because now you know that it's right. like me using a word that I just learned. I could use it right now. And hopefully in a context that doesn't sound, uh, you know, again, like a, a, a have a pompous element to it. It's like we're speaking together on a, you know. Yeah, as- it's still natural. And it was like, that's what completed the idea. So that was the word you chose. And then no different than the musical, like this completes the idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, get, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I, don't I, have to look, I don't have to use some word that you have to look up in order to even know what the fuck I'm talking about. It's like, no, it's very easy to express these things. Right. It's about actually being in the moment, mm-hmm. being present and, and being um, open. If you're not open and you're reserved or you're playing it safe because of this producer, or you're doing this or you're like, oh, I know. It might be a kind of thing, you know, very simply that it's just like maybe somebody says something and you're like, oh, I know what you want. Yeah. And I'll, I can do that thing. But even in doing that, like I work with this uh, producer, Ken Coomer, uh, all the time here in Nashville, and he makes rock records. Okay. Amazing indie records and singer songwriter records, beautiful records. He played with Bill Coe beautiful musician, drummer, producer. But um, uh, the point of that, sorry, I just started thinking about Ken. I got through <laughs> He was the drummer in Wilco? Until uh, through Yankee Foxtrot Hotel. He's the original drummer. Okay, okay. Um, but what was the point that we were just talking about uh, that I was making about uh, working with him? Um, oh, he'll say, because uh, I'll always go into every situation open, like I said. And if I feel like it needs a really melodic moving bass line, like something by the Beatles, just, you know, where it's actually, it's very melodic, it answers the vocals, that kind of thing. Sure. I'll always, you know, I'm not thinking about it as soon as I hear the song and then I go and put on the bass and we all start playing. There's this urgency and this energy. That's more Colonel Bruce shit. He wouldn't let his bands rehearse. There was never a rehearsal. And he was like, what are you going to do? You're going to play the same thing at Carnegie Hall? You're going to play at you know, this tiny little dive bar. Yeah. You know, totally different acoustics, different mood, different audience, different night. Now I've worked up all this stuff that I'm just going to perform for you now. It wasn't about that. Yeah. It was about getting in touch with the moment and creating something bigger than yourself with this group. Uh, and it's the same, it, it's, it all, it's all the same thing. I keep digressing because there's, there, there's so many facets to just not being influenced by anything, but actually what is happening. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Oh, and with Ken, sometimes, sorry, this was the point. No, he'll, okay. say, he'll say, hey, man, just play it dumb. Yeah. Right? So that, that's my instruction. Yeah. So now, this to me, for multiple, multitude of reasons, is the most difficult thing. One, I'm a spaz. <laughs> um, so, like, I, I can't, I mean, I'm, every chorus is going to come in a little different. It's going to, you know, I just going to. Yeah. You know, the, he wasn't playing the, the hi hat open in the first call. Why am I going to play the same? You know, yeah, like, yeah. I have new information yeah. to re- respond to, right? Right, right, right. Uh, same, like, Sly the Family Stone. I mean, that's my ultimate super jam. You okay. know, it's like, it's always evolving. The choruses are, are growing with the tune. Sure, it's I love that stuff. Yeah. It's not the Eagles just cut the first chorus into the rest of the tune and it's done. Well, yeah, you can, I mean, get so much of that from Motown, too. Jamerson did it. Uh, Nathan Watts did it with all on all those Stevie Wonder tracks. I, I love yeah. that. Like, oh yeah, I mean, for once in my life, I mean, who was going to go in there and play that bass line? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> one man. Yeah, well, one. I'm also thinking specifically on the topic um, of developing a line about bass line with the tune in real time is Sir Duke. Now, I think that little lick in Sir Duke by Stevie Wonder gets all the attention, but every chorus Nathan Watts plays on that gets more and more active. And he's right. growing his bass line with the tune. And I kind of get frustrated that everybody's like aiming it to play the lick. Like, oh, I can get the lick out. I can get the lick out. Who cares about the lick? Get the concept of growing your bass line in real time with the tune so that your bass line evolves as the story evolves. People are here's listening. The question, is the, here's the question for you. Is the band even at that dynamic for you to play that, that riff? Right, 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 right. You know, I think I just felt thunder come down. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, the whole thing we've been talking about this whole time. Yeah. So you, oh, you what? You're gonna work out your little part, and you're gonna go in there. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Bruce would say. Right. You know, he's like, I don't want, I want to hear you. 
Yeah. You know, I don't just fuck that part. You know, yeah. the part's cool. But uh, getting but Bruce, back to Bruce that, had a big impact on you, actually. How did you meet him? And how did you, how long were you in the band? Like, tell me more about this experience because this was, this seems to be a very uh, momentous kind of significant landmark presence in your in your career uh it was a 180 shift okay uh, but putting down the, the ken coomer thing though uh i wanted to say about playing dumb mm-hmm. uh i find it challenging I, I said because i'm a spad but also because now the real you have to be more in the moment doing that than ever because yeah. it requires a lot of very subtle phrasing it's all phrasing. Yeah. No strength in, in attack and dynamic and all, it, like all of it is phrasing. But with the, if it's just going to be G whole note, B whole note, B whole note. Now, what is the space between those chords feel like? Where does the lyric stop? Is the drummer pausing on the, you know, on, from the end of four and then coming down? Is there a space? So now you are. Like I won't cutting a track like that. I don't think I'll, I'll breathe even because it's so in the moment. It's so there. Now you're not just running and throwing a football and tackling each other. It's like now you're actually in this very intimate moment. Mm-hmm. Where you're like like you're con- like talking about your feelings with somebody. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah sure. This isn't the time for hiding. This yeah. is the time for subtlety and, yeah. and to make something like that come off. It sounds like oh yeah, cool, dude. To make something like that come off, though, and not be vanilla, or really, more than anything, you can just weigh a track down really badly um, by simply not being really conscious of those note lengths yeah. and allowing them to create impact when you hit the next note. That's a long note. <laughs> yeah. You know, so if you're just running them together through this whole tune, maybe that's what that tune needs. But like more than likely, even just a a ghost note, like you on a kick drum, yeah, or uh, you know, it, it's yeah, or the, the the slightest movement, you know, at just the right. And, and that's the other trick to it that's difficult is not feeling like you're handcuffed to just doing that because you know that there are those moments in the song that even Ken or any producer is thinking like, well, he didn't have to do it the whole time. Yeah, you know, you know, it's just like obviously in this moment, if you want to like make it breathe, you can. We've never had that conversation because I'll just it'll just happen. Sure, you you can hear that you know that it could use this like climb to the bridge. Yeah, know, it's, maybe it's all ambiguous, and now you can kind of unlock that for the track or whatever. Yeah, but but yeah, I'm sorry to move back to that. No, all good. Now, it's all important stuff. It's so important because it is. It's all about phrasing. If you could yeah. boil it down for me, it's about phrasing and getting your butt out of your face. And and it sounds like from what you just spoke about, really trusting your intuition, because all well, it's those trusting your it's trusting your work. Yeah, yeah, you put so much into it. You listen to so many records, right? You know, you 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 bled over lyrics and and (laughs) felt the impact of this again as bruce would put it this very sacred and spiritual thing that was around long before anybody was selling it you Mm -hmm. know it's a it's a cultural device that we use for healing and for celebration yeah uh it, it, it is uh it's an expression of our experience and our culture and it's it's really for those purposes. It's for healing purposes. I think so. You know, I, I completely uh, agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a medical, physical, metaphysical side of that too, but I'm not talking about it. I'm just saying very directly yeah. what it is and what it does. So if you're approaching it from that standpoint, you don't want to, it's not cheap. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's important. It's important. It is. Yeah. Um, but Bruce is the one that brought that, just segue. Um, to my life mm-hmm. because uh, he, uh, I met him at age 30. And to that point, I had never played in a cover band or really done a session or anything outside of just, man, I'm starting this band and we're going to write these amazing albums and we're going to just tour and we're going to do it. And I did it for 10 years, 12 years. Okay. I had a couple of my own bands and we were, we were 250 nights a year in a band, <sighs> just 
Lugging it Man, out. Man, grinding. Just grinding. This was 90s. This was 90s. There was yeah. you no know, Instagram that you could just get shit yeah, yeah. out. Right. And then show up. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's applicable in so many facets of 90s culture versus today's culture. Yeah. Uh, actually uh, having uh, to show up and do something. Yeah. Well, getting back to Bruce, that was his. If you asked him, you know, what do you do? How do you do this? Like, have a career in music. Like, how could you possibly be Jimmy Herring or Paul McCartney or all, all of these different people that you listen to and admire and they did it, they had it. Like, what do I, like, I have this talent, I have this ability and I know I have this dream and this feeling. What do I do? He's like, all you can do is show up. Yeah. That's the only piece of advice he said that he could give is you have to show up because if you don't show up, it doesn't happen. Right. You've got you got to go out and hear music. You've got to go out and, and be present and apply yourself and, you know, start a band or get go out to jam sessions. You know, you have to be engaged because yeah. if you just sit at home and be brilliant. It, it won't ever. Um, it won't escalate on, on those terms. I think you know. from what uh, my experience with those ideas are here in Los Angeles, it's the people that are doing the woe is me. How come they always get the thing? But then they're at home, you know, either maybe they're working on their craft or maybe they're just throwing a pity party. But like, uh, like go book a gig, man. Like, so if you're real if, frustrated that someone else has the gig, go book a gig. So may, maybe I shouldn't even tell this story because then you're definitely just selling your place and moving here. <laughs> no, I got a realtor but looking I'm right now. Here. I'm running out my time till I find out to... Uh, you know. I, you're, you're, you're fucked in about 20 <laughs> seconds. When, when I moved here, I went out the first three nights, my buddy Patrick Sweeney, longtime friend, brilliant blues musician and rock musician. I know that name. I know that name. Yeah, he has his own rock career, and he's, that's his songs. But on okay. Monday nights, we have a band called the Tiger Beats that plays all post-war electric blues. Oh, cool. The Gate Mouth Brown, Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, but he took me out, and all three nights, the bass player was this guy, Steve Mackey, okay. who is my favorite bass player in town. If I, I hate to even say that out loud because there's other people I really love and admire. Sure. Uh, but yeah, he, he's amazing, and I love him. And before he had even asked me to sit in or anything, he got off the stage, and I walked up to him, and Pat was like, hey, man, this is my good friend. And maybe Pat had set him up like, you know, this guy's my friend that I played with or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, but anyway, he, he just had so much joy on his face right there, first meeting. And, and, and he shook my hand and he said, oh, you're a bass player and you just moved to town. And he put his arm, his hand on my arm and said, man, when I first moved to town, I went out and the first bass player I saw was Dave Rowe. Okay. Dave Rowe was the bass player for Johnny Cash all the way up through his passing uh, yeah. for, for many years. And before that, Jerry Reed. Mm -hmm. um, another of my very favorite Nashville bass players and good friend here in town. Amazing yeah. dude. But he, he moved here. He went out for his experience, first experience. He saw Dave Rowe, introduced himself on the break and said, oh, bass player, grabbed his shoulder and said, man, we could never have enough great musicians in this town. Let me buy you a drink. Nice. nice. Because... And man, and now I'm good friends with Dave. I'm good friends with Steve. I'm good friends with Ron Oaf, my amazing right. bass player. There, there's a, a community here that, again, I hate to even talk about it in a public setting because <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to spoil it. <laughs> the city's already screwed because we're we're just blasting out into this huge metropolis. Yeah, I've been um, hearing a lot about that. Like you guys, Austin, uh, Colorado. There's a bunch of cities that kind of. I'm from Phoenix, and even I was talking with my dad the other day. Like, uh, so many, he told me the stat of how many people moved to Phoenix straight from here, yeah. like straight from LA. Everybody's going to these, to these cities. Yeah, well, I, I know this. Um, the point of that was that there's a vitality because the musicians support each other and rally behind each other. Sure. So the competition element here is zippo. Right. Like, it, there are I I've heard of it. I haven't encountered it in seven years now. Yeah, um, not not once where somebody was like felt like I was moving in on something, or I felt like somebody was 
you know, it just seems like the most absurd thing you could be spending your energy thinking about. Sure. Uh, sure. Particularly when, again, my subs for my <laughs> Monday residency from six to eight at the five spot, the subs are uh, Robert Kearns, enough, my pub, second. I mean, I hate to rank anybody. Yeah, Robert yeah. Kearns on base or Cheryl Crow, you know, or Dave Rowe or Mackey. It's like, yeah, it's crazy. Right. The well here is so deep. Uh, the old guard, the new guard, and everybody that I've worked with in this whole amount of time has only brought trust and openness to every situation. That's great. Uh, getting back to being on the floor, you yeah. know, it's, uh, it's something um, as counterintuitive as it was to me for me to learn rules and theory about music uh, in order to create more freedom and more expression. You know, I didn't get that when I was young. And again, when I started playing jazz with that band, when I started playing with groups, all of those musicians were jazz musicians. Okay. So we, we got jazz gigs and I did a lot of gigs with them before I moved on to start playing with Grant and those guys. Um, but um, the, uh, oh, what was the point? Talking about the community and how welcoming the community was. Yeah. Um, Oh, just, I don't know, that everybody will go and do any of those gigs. Right. You go play for $40. It doesn't have to be a $5,000 hit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a real scene here, and I've stayed really, you, you mentioned I've been busy. I, I really have. Yeah. Um, and, and I still go out on the road with Oliver Wood, and lately a group called Donna the Buffalo, and a, a few other uh, projects, but Jimmy Hall, um, mm -hmm. who's amazing. Um, but you know, mostly I just try to stay in town and this month I'm not leaving town and I'm working quite a bit. So, um, uh, are, those, are those record dates? Are you doing sessions? Or are those some, Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And live shows with just amazing bands and artists. Like, yeah. Good God. Like the greatest, <laughs> greatest drummers in the world. <laughs> like amazing artists. Uh, I'm really excited about this month. I'm not, Sweet. I'm going to spend Every night at home. <laughs> nice. Um, have you ever written your own stuff or put together That's your own I project? Did. That's all I did before I played with Bruce. And then he really, um, you know, for a, a while there, it became more about um, stripping back the ego mm. uh, and less about... Uh, presenting it <laughs> that bruce's thing was he he considered himself a minor league coach okay so he would um he never once told me a chord or a thing to play or how to do something or a suggestion or a musical thing he wasn't a wasn't really knowledgeable either he was also a folk musician in that regard you know he didn't have musical theory or his thing was all about stripping the ego. Yeah. Um, all are largely based around the great philosopher, Jay Krishnamurti, whose whole thing is that we all view things through filters. Yes. I so we immediately, you know, the moment I go to play you like, oh man, this guitar track, this is my favorite guitar track in the history of guitar. It's the story of my life by Guitar Slam. Just, just, just listen to this. And you don't even know that it's blues. You just know that I'm just going to play this thing for you. Yeah. And I put it on and immediately your brain goes, oh. Yeah, it's this. It's, it's, it's this. Yeah, it's this yeah. thing. But you and can probably metalize it. Right. Me, but I know what to expect. What are they going to do with the four chord here? You yeah. know, it's like now you've totally missed them. Right. You know, and that's getting your butt out of your face. The same thing. It's about removing those barriers so you can actually see what's there. You can respond without being driven by some kind of... Um, false or preconceived notion is there some kind of uh personal practice you did away from the instrument to develop this mindset or to kind of immerse yourself in these ideas and in this concept did no, you do any kind of meditative music. thing or was it no. always just on the bandstand there's nothing more meditative than playing music I, I, yeah. yeah 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 uh sit down with your guitar for just a minute right and see what see what else you're thinking about Sure. You know, uh, for me, the whole experience was about uh, if there was anything secondary 
to the music itself, as far as getting to that place, it was simply the hang. Yeah. And with Bruce, the hang was intense because okay. there, there was no drugs, no alcohol, uh, because he wanted you to be present. Again, sure. Getting back to that element of actually being there. If you're the only one on the bandstand at Stone and everybody's looking at you like, hey, man, let's, we're going to go into, you know, come, where are you? Um, so, you know, he was like, would you, you want your dentist smoking a joint before he drills out your teeth? <laughs> That's what he said to me the first time. I was like, I can't smoke weed. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, um, but yeah, he would do things like I toured. This is not a joke. We were playing small venues. Uh, sometimes the PA would be like two little 12 inch speakers on tree stands in front yeah. of the band. No monitors or maybe one monitor. Oof. Uh, he, he had me tour on electric bass in a loud ass combo where the guitar player played through a Leslie and a super. My God. Super, and the drummer playing all out. Yeah. I'm on electric bass, no amp. Just the main. Re- just the main. The reason to save gas. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Now the Leslie, like still transporting the Leslie. The super weighed more than the, me and the drummer put together. The drummer <laughs> The drummer was Tyler Greenwell, the Falcon from the Tedeschi Trucks Band. Okay, okay. Uh, oh, you did some yeah. work with them, right? Oh yeah, a long, yeah. long time. Still, uh, still really close, and he's still in that band. Okay. Um, but yeah, I was. Uh, I met them. That's another Bruce connection. As soon as I started playing with Bruce, I lost you for a second. Um, I can hear as you. As, there you oh, Bruce, yeah, I met Derek and Susan very shortly after. We all just became very close. So yeah. when um, Susan needed a bass player and I was just coming out of Bruce's band uh, around 2005, uh, I joined the Susan Tedeschi band mm-hmm. and was in that band through the formation of Tedeschi Trucks, okay. which was um, beyond Derek and Susan, the obvious coming together and being able to tour together and be in a band together. There was also the beautiful reunion of both Kofi Burbridge, who I mentioned earlier, uh, and his brother, O'Teal Burbridge, mm-hmm. um, who, you know, they had not been in a band together. Um, well, I, I, I don't want to misquote anything, yeah. but uh, for a very long time, okay. um, you know, Kofi had been playing with Derek for a very long time and O'Teal went on to join the Allman Brothers. Right. Uh, and before that was with the Aquarium Rescue Unit. So O'Teal and Derek were very close because of Bruce. Okay. And, and from the beginning, uh, from the Aquarium Rescue Unit would even have Derek come out and sit in on guitar when he was, you know, a preteen, even nice. or a teenager. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, Derek had known O'Teal. O'Teal and Derek had known each other all of Derek's life. And, yeah, yeah. And not to mention being, you know, pound for pound, the greatest bass player. <laughs> 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 It's ridiculous. Really, yeah. like, I, it's a shame that so much of that music wasn't documented, but man, that man, Colonel Bruce Hampton and the Aquarium Rescue Unit in the early 90s is still the most outrageous and amazing band I've ever seen. Mm. It was extraordinary. It was Jimmy Herring, O'Teal Burbridge, Jeff Syke on drums, and uh, for a while, a mandolinist named uh, Matt Mundy. Who, okay. Um, who called a quiz, but that group was devastating. Uh, and they have a live album that's that's fairly representative of what they did. But uh, oh man, it was it was a really it was a special thing that they had going on, and it was all based on improv. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you could you could go anywhere, do anything. Any song could be in any style or tempo or genre. It didn't matter. Or yeah. you could just turn on dime. Somebody might pl- start playing. Double times Idaho over a ballad, and then the whole band might go against it or go with it. It didn't yeah. matter. Because yeah. everybody had a full grip on being in the moment, and everybody was better than everybody on their instrument to yeah, boot. Yeah. You know. So uh yeah, Bruce's tutelage was, you know, it was about improvement through uh very benevolent abuse. <laughs> <laughs> is still is he still is he still with us? Is he still around? No, unfortunately, he, he passed uh, just a few years ago mm. um, on his 70th birthday. Um, they threw a concert for him and a lot of the people from his life were there to play with him. At the time, I was on tour with Doyle Bramhall and we had a 
five or six week tour um, in Europe. Okay. Uh, during the concert that was booked, even when he called me about the show. So I wasn't there. I got a call that night, but he actually, um, it was on his, the eve of his 70th birthday. Um, and then while performing the, the song that got him interested in music in the first place, Love Light, Turn On Your Love Light by Bobby Blue Bland. Mm -hmm. uh, he saw that band when he was a teenager and it, it just turned his life upside down. And that's what he wanted to do. Okay. And that was a song that we played every night. Yeah. Without question. And, uh, and it was his favorite tune. So he came, came out for the last encore, 17, 25 people on stage at the Fox theater sold out for his name for his 70th birthday party. And, um, a big component of his, um, mythocracy, or even if, if you ever saw him or knew him, it was a lot about performance. So, um, you know, at any given time, we could all end up just on the floor, you know, just asleep during okay. the game okay. with a packed house, you know, or he had, he had this, <laughs> the dead thorax, which he would just initiate it, but basically the whole top half of your body just goes completely limp. <laughs> and you just like kind of. <laughs> with your guitar dangling or falling off. You know, so it, it was a lot of performance. If there was like some tubing that wasn't fast and he might go over and grab it, put it up to my ear and have me say something about it on the mic. You know, it's like okay. it was always improv, it was always theater too. Sure. But at this show during Love Light, after completing the tune, he laid down on the stage. And um, right in, in front of and Derek and, and Jimmy and, again, so many um, people had been there his whole life and all of us impacted uh, by him more than probably uh, than any others, certainly out of any kind of parent. Um, and uh, they didn't, nobody knew what was going on, but uh, he died. Right there um, on stage. Right there. Wow. And then uh, wow. uh, uh, another friend of mine, I won't mention his name. Um, That's heavy. Devon, I think uh, my friend revived him, and there was an ambulance trip to the hospital, and he didn't make it. Um, and I believe, you know, I, I haven't checked because it, it's really been a difficult thing for me to visit. Um, and I don't even talk about him really ever or much, uh, except in the van. It's really fun to go off about it, but I don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I believe he actually passed on his birthday, uh, with again, the concert being the eve of it. Wow, uh, but you um, you couldn't make that shit up. Yeah, he he was the most mysterious and wonderful, loving and benevolent giver, uh, and really had a grip on what music meant. Uh, and if he couldn't always verbalize it, he knew if he wasn't getting it, and he was really hard on his bands. You know, because it wasn't about getting a riff or a hit right or whatever. It was about being engaged and making something happen. See, that's the other side of this. You had all of these brilliant musicians come through his camp. We're talking about John Abercrombie, John Landy, Paul McCandless, like the top of the heap yeah. of, of people like playing jazz music and, and, and putting behind him even. He... He all he cared about was the feeling he got from it because he's a very simple folk musician, and we all cared about the feeling we got from him because on any given night, just deliver, and I mean cut anybody with very few notes, you know, sort of akin to how BB King would, you know, sound yeah, next yeah. to somebody who's really probably very good at what they do, yeah. <laughs> but just in the wrong met the wrong guy in the alley. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Wow, but, man, that's that's heavy. That's heavy. Yeah, he uh, he was he he did he he knew at the core what it was and how important it was, and it was really important for him to help people find themselves. Uh, getting back to Derek Trucks, you know, he just plugged straight into the amp. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know a lot of people do that, but like it's about Bruce used to call it pedals Tonka toys. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear you. Yeah. You know, it was that kind of a, of a, again, constant hazing. 
of like learning how to use your pen. Okay, I can't use a pedal. Okay. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like, uh, how do you do this? I turn it down. I mean, it's clean. You turn it up and it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's not science. It's pretty easy. Right. But, um, but yeah, he would just, um, that was his magic and his gift was really stripping down. It didn't have to be. It, 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 most of the time, it wasn't even anything about music. Right. You know, maybe you were really sensitive about people who were homophobic or something. You know, he had a way of just grinding you or talking about your sister. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like nothing was off limits. So it was, he was kind of always playing this uh, contrarian. We're all Twelve-year-old kids in a tree yeah, house, yeah. like cutting on each other, basically right. all the time. But you know, if he set down a thing, it's just like, well, you know, this month you're only going to make seventy-five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> talking about, I, it's just like, well, you can work at UPS. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, get a route. You could do that. You know, it was just like. This constant uh, reinforcing of who you really are. Wow. And a stripping of any kind of uh, ailment that might prevent it, be prevent any part of your butt is stuck right here. Right. You know, like, well, maybe this isn't going to work out and I'll go do this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right there. It's right there. <laughs> Just crack. Yeah. You know, yeah. Now, because you'll be somebody else in your 30 or 40 or 50. Yeah. You know, but in, in the moment, you have to uh, you have to do that. You have to be in the moment. And it's it's more than being Zen. It's like I said, the, the Krishnamurti thing. If you don't know uh, the philosopher Jake and writer Jake Krishnamurti, I highly recommend just even reading a synopsis okay. about his work and, and, and his thoughts. Yeah, but it is it's it's about removing barriers sure. um, to th- things that are actually there and not just how you're. Perceiving them. I don't know if you've seen everything everywhere all at once, but there's a lot of that in it. Uh, you know, about how I don't think you I just had something in your head you thought was true, and now that's an actual thing in your head. Oh, right, right. <laughs> yeah. It isn't true. Yeah, it, it gets is, into like some, uh, I don't know. I, I think so many different aspects or spiritual trains of thought or whatever have different verbiages for it, but the, your idea then becomes the belief. As soon as you believe it, it becomes an action, then it becomes your reality. It's it's that lineage. And That's so you right. gotta you gotta be really cautious about really how you think about yourself and the world around you because it's gonna end up playing itself out at some point. And even if you're creating it, it's there whether you're paying attention to it or not. Yeah. It's just running you in the think background. Like, oh, no, I'm focused on this. I just know that that might happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what we're talking about. Right, right, right. right, right. This has to just not exist. Yeah. You know, to free yourself to really, and that's a that's a dumb one to even use as an analogy, but it's that's what I'm saying. It's all related to that same principle, actually just being present. Sure. Not, uh, not trying, but just doing. Right. Really. Yeah. And for the sake of, uh, without trying to prove anything or alleviating your ego or, being that's who you are part. and not who you want to be, you know? Yeah, no, that's the healthy part of the ego. Yeah. Is that, like, I'm not going to go in there and try to cut this track. I'm going to go in there and, and smoke this track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go annihilate this, right? Yeah, and it's not because I need to get hyped up before the game. It's just I'm excited. I'm genuinely excited. Sure. You know, sure. it's like to be there, to be in this moment, this experience. And then, again, there's just extreme urgency there. Creating, mm-hmm. you're really, really listening to what everybody is doing. Yeah, which also like just even aids because you can't take the time to think about what you're doing. Right. I used I used to really I used to a lot of things. I use that a lot. Um, <laughs> I'm still growing every every day. That's great, man. That's great. I I couldn't even begin to um, accept the concept that a, that an artist would write these songs. And walk into a studio like in Nashville and hire a, a group of unknown musicians and or even know them, maybe best friends with all of them, who cares? Simply hear a song one time off of an iPhone, and maybe not all the way through, just a verse and a chorus, and it's just like, oh yeah, this repeats, and here let me show you the bridge. Beep. Okay. Yeah. Here's the bridge. So somebody, right, while this is going on, is just listening, or all of us, and writing a chart. 
if they don't already have one. So you have one listen, you write out the chart just by ear. You go out onto the floor and then, you know, with a lot of the, well, with everybody that I'm working with, you know, the first take is going to be the dog. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, nobody's going in there to like figure it out. Right, or right. Like, like, oh, well, let's just do another one and I'll try this. It's just like, there has to be that healthy ego that just goes in there and says, there's this enormous thing with all of this weight. It has to be right. It's, it's got to emote what this person's trying to bring to the table. But what happens is when you're, when you're not putting so much thought and effort into it, you've already heard the song. Right. Now you just put on your instrument. How many times have you ever been at somebody's house and they're like, oh, let me show you the song real quick. And then you play it and you're like, ah, it's incredible. You know, like everybody's getting off because yeah. you're finding it in the moment and it's like all oh, like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's like it's, it's fun and it's happening. Yeah, it's yeah. fun. Right. You're actually having a conversation. It's just running into three people in a bar and you're like, what? You like music too? Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's just talking, but now you're doing it on your instrument, like it's basketball or any other thing, like you're having fun. Sure. Um, and uh, to me, the idea that you would just go in there in one or two takes after hearing the song and that's what the record is, like, really? Yeah. Like, I was like, how lame? Why wouldn't you get, like, people together to actually, like, learn the songs, you know, feel up prepared, we're going to record this and we're going to, you know, we know what we're going to do. and because I was always in my own bands, and I right. just thought that was kind of a lame cop out. Or also that a producer would always have a core group of musicians that they like to work with, and then the band would get screwed when it came right. time to do the record. Because if you're going to work with this producer, you have to use, you know, yeah, their session guys. A and B. Yeah. yeah, not to mention any name. I mean, that's the way it works. Now I get it. Yeah, because you go in there with those crews, and everybody, everybody loves. To have a conversation. Yeah, yeah. Everybody loves being there and, and works with each other and loves hanging out. So really all we're doing is hanging out. Yeah. yeah. We get to do the most fit, fun thing, you know, outside of our private lives that we ever get to do, which is play music. Yeah. So it's um again, it's a community and a and a real kinship, I feel here, whether it's the producers that I've been working with or the especially the musicians. Uh, and just photographers and publicists. I never knew any of those kind of people. I grew mm-hmm. up in Athens, Georgia, which was amazing and wonderful. And I, uh, you know, I lived in Atlanta for a long time. I never had any of that. Right. I couldn't get a gig at a hotel in Atlanta. <laughs> I really, I, I couldn't. Yeah. I really, I couldn't. There, there was just, there was no work. There was no, and I, I didn't even know what work was. Again, I'd always just played in original bands. Even with Bruce, we didn't really play covers. We were just making up songs. Right. You know, making records and stuff. So, uh, yeah, that was all new for me. Um, you asked about writing. I've written with Susan and with Derek and Susan for Tedeschi Trucks and um, written a bunch of stuff recently. I wrote something with Amy Helm for her record and uh, constantly writing Oliver Wood's record. I wrote with him for that. We're getting together soon, working on some stuff too. So the writing thing is a huge component that, you know, if I were talking to somebody that was interested in getting into music or just starting out, I, you know, that would be the, the number one. And that's what, that's what I focused on until I was 30. And then again, with Bruce, it became more about like, oh shit, I need to know what I'm doing. <laughs> right you know, so like my yeah. days would be spent with a real book, even just trying to play, you know, the, the most simple songs, you know, right. well, you need, well, you need, it, you right. know, and just really shedding it and make sure that I could like hang when it came time to really dig in and play it. And that I wouldn't be stuck to some kind of rote part, but actually be able to do what we're talking about. Right. Um, which is like be in the moment and, you know, not to say, I mean, Oliver Wood's trio that I'm currently in is the most free situation I've been in a long time since I played with Okay. Anything goes all anything goes all the time. We're all there in the moment, creating, singing our hearts out, laughing at what each other is doing. Really, really engaged with one another. But there's still baseline. Yeah. You know, there's still parts. There's things that I know it's like, oh, this is what sets this off, or this is what I made up here, or this is what sure. it is. So it's not like the 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 release of information. It's just trusting that you're going to do the right thing. Right. 
So if in that moment, I hear the verse really coming down for the last verse, and normally I play like a tuba kind of part. Why would I do that again? Yeah, you yeah. know, like at that moment, my first inclination of just talking to you right now is, ooh, lay out. Yeah. Like, let it just die. Yeah. You know, because then I know where we're going and when I'll bring it back. You know, it's like, because you're having fun with it. You're building a fort, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly, exactly. You're creating yeah. something. Yeah. You're creating something. Right. Uh, but the Nashville thing, man, what a trip. The, uh, going in and doing records that way, where you just submit, and it's done. They're amazing. Yeah. I... You know, I always knew that it was bogus to do more than two or three takes on something because the energy was gone and people start like thinking like, oh, when I did this, that was cool. So I'll do that there. Right. You start you know? like comping your own takes like, all right, first time I did this thing, I'm going to try to do that thing. But then this thing I did from take two yeah. on the bridge. Let me see if I can play all this shit live. And you, right. you start comping yourself. That's what happens. Your and yeah. then guess what else happens? Everybody else is doing that, and the right. whole thing that made that thing work that one time on right. playback is now bullshit because nobody's doing what they were doing when you did that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it doesn't have the same context at all. You're, you're cooked. It's right. over. Right. Yeah. Again, now you're playing a lick. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, it's dumb. It is. It is. Ted, this has been great, man. Thanks so much. Thanks oh, so much man. for doing Thank this. Thank you so much for having me. I, I've never done something. I mean, I've done a couple of magazine things, never anything like this. It's really fun. Oh, man, at any time, uh, you got something that you got a new record coming out. You're going on doing some tour dates. Let me know. Let's come back on and talk about it. Yeah, I'll get your contact information in, uh, and send you some stuff too. That's okay. Going on around here. It's really cool. Too. That'd be great. That'd be great. I'll definitely, I'm definitely looking to do some, uh, get over to the East Coast probably this summer. So if, if I end up man, in Nashville. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You're going to have to oh, take me out to the jams. Man, it's come on a, like a Sunday through Tuesday. Oh, perfect. Su Sunday through Wednesday. Perfect. Okay. That's easy. That's easy. Yeah, that's, that's the way to do it. All right. Kill it, dude. We'll be in touch. Okay. Take care, All man. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Ted. All right, all right, all right, that was my talk with Ted Pecchio. Dude, I mean, like, Ted's just dropping knowledge, man. There's so many just little, uh, I don't even know what you want to call them. They're not necessarily motivational. Um, there's just so many little nuggets of perspective, I guess, would be the best way to talk about it. Um, wonderful, wonderful time talking to Ted and uh, looking forward to having him back on the show uh, whenever, whenever that can work out. Whenever that can work out and uh, maybe making it out to Nashville and doing a hang, that would be that would be fun too. If you are enjoying the Bay Shed podcast, please hit subscribe wherever you are listening to it. And uh, as always, folks, thanks for listening to the show. I will catch you on the next one in a minute.